Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the second series from the incredible Mr. Savage, a follow-on to the Nightmare of Winter storyline. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled The Memories of Summer, Part 1. Let's get straight into that. To say that Bradley Camp was a good-natured, easy-going fellow would be a long stretch of the truth. Truth be told, he was the exact opposite, which is probably the reason why he ended up way the hell out in the middle of nowhere, Georgia. Currently, he was making his home on a large island out in the middle of J. Strom Thurman Reservoirs, a little river channel. The nearest means of easy pickings was the Holiday Park, Wilkes County Recreational Area. He would fish from his kayak during the day when he wasn't snoozing in the shade. He would make his move at night, paddling quietly across the channel to prey on the unsuspecting campers. He had, over the last several months, gained a plethora of small coolers, fishing gear, cell phones and tools, and other small treasures, while the loud chirping of crickets and other night sounds masked his crimes. He had a ten-inch long hunting knife that he carried, but... He wouldn't prefer to use it unless he had to. A stabbing would have the law comb in an area and he didn't care for that type of attention. That would make being on the run <laughs> sort of fruitless in his eyes. The fact he'd escaped the clutches of the law thus far was probably a miracle in itself. Camping on the islands overnight was prohibited in Georgia, although it was completely fine to visit them during the day. He made his camp in the center of the island, with a thick canopy of trees and a wall-to-wall -wall of brush covering his living space. He would keep his stolen kayak tucked away into the brush when he wasn't on the water, and scan around for boats for a while before he would put it into the water on the far side of the island, where those using the park wouldn't be able to see him. And to avoid game wardens, he kept a short fishing rod and a sack of tackle tucked between his legs in the hull until he reached the deepest part of the main cove. Here, there were plenty of bushes growing from the water that provided a natural cover, and the cove as well, it was away from the main channel. Less than a quarter of it could be seen from the boat in lanes without entering into the smaller channel that led along the park's waterfront estate. The wardens would sometimes see him afloat during the day, and barely give a passing glance, noting only a thin man in a small dark green kayak, pleasurably, paddling about. Brad worried about those bastards pretty often. As soon as they ran his name, it would be the end of the road. This whole stupid journey started back in Michigan. He grew up living half on the streets, moving from one ramshackle place to another, with his struggling single mother between Burton and Grand Blanc, a little east-southeast of Flint. As he entered his teens, he quickly made a name for himself, with both the street thugs and local law enforcement. He found himself in plenty of street fights and had a nasty scar across his lower abdomen from a smart mouth drifter's razor blade. He made his money busting into cars and storage lockers and had been arrested twice on breaking and entering charges before he was sentenced to four years on his third bust. He came out of prison at 22, a little harder and cunning than before. He took to peddling a little bit of drugs and dealing in stolen goods. He met a young girl named Raquel, and before long she was pregnant and they were separated. He struggled to pay child support and competition in the street. He was busted again this time with enough crystal meth and marijuana to put him upstate for seven long years of a ten-year sentence. Then he was released from prison just before his 30th birthday on parole where he immediately took flight down to his cousin's homestead in central Georgia. He worked under the table for his cousin, Matthew, for several months, enjoying the near slave labor of being a mason's laborer, before his cousin started noticing money and tools missing, and caught him with drugs. 
He lost his job and was thrust onto the streets of Augusta, Georgia. He found that, other than the sweltering heat and the humidity that never left the air, no matter the season, Augusta was not much different than his original stomping ground, albeit a bit cleaner with warmer people. He sought refuge for a little while with the Salvation Army homeless shelter before landing seedy work in the area's booming underground drug trade. Everything came to a head one night at the nightclub known as the Playground, located just off Broad Street near the 10th Street. He had been selling a little bit of dope behind the place before heading inside. Amongst a crowded room of First Friday patrons, he noticed two more people that stood out. A mountain of a man with long brown hair tied back and a ponytail while shooting pool and a voluptuous blonde practically owning the dance floor. Of the two, the blonde woman was his main focus. She twirled to a Hispanic number as a white tank top and snug jeans hugged a perfect figure without even a hair falling out of place. He was enraptured by her immediately, as was the majority of men in the room, save for the big guy playing pool and a few guys engrossed in their dates. Brad was a bold fellow and with what he figured were A-rated features. After several shots and a quick like of the clear in the restroom, he moved into the dance with the woman. She seemed to accept, and towards the end of the song, he placed his hand on her backside, attempting to pull her in closer. Instead of reciprocating, she planted a firm right cross on his jaw. In his drug and alcohol induced, he hauled his hand back and slapped her right across the left eye. Tyler! The blonde woman screamed at the top of her lungs as the current song died out. Brad watched the massive man leap from the railing that encircled the upper level of the bar where the pool tables were located. The man's feet hit the floor almost gracefully as he strode towards Brad with a fury swirling around his form. Folks just seemed to part like a Red Sea before him as cell phones were pulled out to capture the fight on video. One short but stocky bouncer tried to block his path, but the man almost stepped on him as he vigorously shoved him out of his path. Brad had no fear of the big guy. He traded blows with his type before. All rage, no strategy. It was simple, in his mind. Stay out of his way, and either out of his reach or too close for him to land blows while punishing him as much as possible. He had a folding razor knife in his pocket and a 380 pistol tucked on his waistband. The big guy reached for Brad and took no time at all beginning this assault. Brad managed a few good punches while trying his best to dodge the man's fists. Several of those big meaty fists found purchase on Brad's body. Oh, this fucker was far faster and stronger than he had initially let on. Brad tried a combination of kicking the man in the groin while grabbing him by the ears to bring his knee to the man's face. This plan to level a playing field failed miserably. As the man's knee blocked his kick, Brad's reaching hands were swept away before an explosive uppercut sent sparks through his vision. He felt one of his teeth chip as his back hit the dance floor. The man moved to fall upon him, fists ready to beat him to pieces as his meth and adrenaline fueled mind reacted. He rolled sideways, drawing the blade from his pocket. He flipped it open as he rushed to meet the big bastard. He ripped the blade across the soft flesh of the man's torso, and then brought it up to across his face. The big man lurched back, growling animalistically, as his eyes seemed to burn red with hatred. And realizing all too late that he had made a mistake that would send him to prison if the guy didn't kill him first, Brad fled the bar. As he rounded the corner, making towards his motorcycle, a flashlight illuminated him, and he heard an officer bark at him to freeze. Still, riding his high, both narcotic and natural, Brad turned, drawn his Taurus 380, and shot the cop twice in the face before he fell to the pavement. Fuck! God damn it! Fuck! Brad exclaimed as the reality of his situation truly dawned upon him. He turned back towards the bike. A young couple stood frozen, having just exited their car. The man held up his hands, and Brad leveled a pistol and put a round into his chest. The man fell, with the girl moving to his side. Brad grabbed her by the hair and put the gun to her head, and they made flight with her, held at gunpoint, 
attempting to casually drive away from the city. Brad got comfortable after the blue lines of several cop cars passed without giving an inconspicuous sedan a passing glance. What he didn't realise in his initial panic was the fact that he left his motorcycle behind and the entire incident was caught on security cameras focused on the rear of the bar. And he forced the girl to drive him out to a secluded boat ramp his cousin had taken him to months ago. A place called White Rock Launch, located down White Rock Road. The narrow dirt road was seldom travelled and there were only a few houses at the beginning. And he made the girl, Samantha, drive all the way down the four mile stretch of desolate path until the empty parking area came into view. And Brad had his way with her a couple of times, knowing no one could hear her sobs and screams. He forced her back into the car on her back, while she was still nude and held her across the console as he butchered her throat with a razor blade. Samantha's body spasmed as she bled out. Brad did the last of his dope on the roof of the car in a big fat line before he shoved the corpse into the passenger seat. He wrapped the seatbelt around her body and fastened it in place. He backed up several yards before he sped directly towards the boat ramp and where the windows rolled down. The car travelled about 30 yards into the water where it began to sink on the edge of the drop-off. Brad then quickly exited the open driver window of the car as it sank 25 feet to the edge of the drop-off and then slipped down the ledge slope before falling another 40 feet to the bottom of the channel, dragging poor Samantha's lifeless, violated body with it to the cold, murky depths where it still rests until this day. Brad was leisurely paddling along the bank of the park, scoping the goods at the campus as he saw a big black lifted Chevrolet pickup pulling into the site 15, the second to the last of the sites before entering the cove. And he watched as that striking blonde and that big bastard that caused him so much trouble in the first place exited the camp. Revenge boiled in his mind as he watched them set up their camp and he turned and paddled back up the channel he stopped by his home island and grabbed a semi-cold Budweiser and a camp shovel from behind his stolen tent. He took back to the water after down in the brew and set off a smaller island that he had buried several coolers on as a cache for things he wouldn't want to be caught with. Things like stolen wallets, jewellery and a few firearms he'd lifted from vehicles in the dead of the night. Well, he loved coolers, simply dumped them out and they float. They're weather resistant especially the more expensive ones, with the precious seal. He had towed plenty of coolers across the lake behind his kayak in the dead of the night without incident. Once he reached the island, he unfolded the shovel and began poking around. He couldn't quite remember exactly where he'd buried the Yeti 20 that held the Ruger Super Blackhawk 44 Magnum, where he had taken from an old fisherman's truck on an early spring morning haze. He dug around several spots, bringing up five various coolers that didn't contain what he was looking for. Well, he was intent on blasting that big bastard in the chest so he could lay there helplessly while he was forced to watch him use that blonde. And that was the start of all of this drama. The Ruger would be loud as hell, but it wouldn't raise any suspicion. People fired shots around these parts occasionally, killing snakes during the day and warding off coyotes at night. He simply would wash the gun, clean it and place it in another camp later in the night. As for the man, he'd leave him there. Hmm, but the girl, he chuckled. She would be coming to the island with him. He had gone long enough without a companion to entertain him, and she was a special kind of treasure. He'd often kicked himself for not making that pretty little Samantha girl his captive, but in hindsight... It would have been fairly difficult to move her around while he found and stole his necessary resources. And sure, he'd had his fill of being a serial killer and rapist in these last few months. He had been slipping around the lake far from his home island and snatching young girls from the campsites. He'd ambushed one at the swimming area where she'd been hanging around alone. And he'd waited beside the outhouse type restroom and barged in the door as she swung it closed. And her body 
still lay at the bottom of the pit below the toilet. He took her keys and moved her car completely to the other side of the recreation area. Going through its contents, and he discovered a suicide note. Hmm, how lucky, he thought, as he lay it on the dash and abandoned the car. Now the police combed the entire area, fruitlessly, deciding that she'd simply swam out far into the water before either slitting her wrists or succumbing to a drug overdose. They never knew her body lay in a sewage pit, rotting with the waste below. The suicide note she had planned to burn and forget her, almost serious thoughts after a talk with a local Cherokee medicine man. In total, Brad's murder spree included five women across seven months, not including the cop, the man, or Samantha. He was a monster, and he knew it well. He felt the world made him this way. He was a product of this filthy environment, he was almost proud having escaped the grip of the police, running free on his own accord. And what he couldn't know is that a rather new wildlife enforcement officer, former Marine Corps, gunnery sergeant, and former Georgia State Patrol officer by the name of Ryan Kelly was slowly putting the puzzle pieces together against him. Brad was digging furiously when he stuck a stone-like structure beneath the soil on the island. He shoveled a little dirt back over it and in disgust before striking pay dirt. He lifted the black hawk from the sea foam green cooler and revealed it in its glory. Unknown to him, the sunlight streaming through a crack in the old petrified wood of the casket roused a pair of white dead eyes, sunken into the withered flesh of the ancient face. The being drew its first breath as it waited for night to fall, the sun lightly irritating the skin on its face before the dirt was shoveled over the hole once more. More eons than the being could count had passed since those eyes had clenched shut after being entombed too deeply under the earth to escape. The thick iron chains that had bound the coffin had rusted away leaving only the cypress boards impervious to the acidic red clay intact as they petrified into stone. Tyler Hillmark stretched his muscular body after setting his tent near the old wooden picnic table on the flattest surface of the campsite. And he glanced over at his gorgeous bride as the sun made her blonde hair blaze. And he still admired her after all of these years. The vampiric transformation process takes around seven years to fully perfect the host body, and she looked about 25 or so. Perfect, model-esque features had taken place of her former body. He loved her for who she was, but he couldn't ignore her trim waist, perfect large breasts, nor her ample hips and long legs. What are you staring at there, Wolfie? She said, her voice like a symphony of angels to his ears. Ah, just the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, he replied while she smiled brightly. She walked back to the 82 Scottsdale and grabbed his pack of smokes before lighting one herself. Tyler had discovered the title to the truck in the glove box, and after researching the name on the title, he eventually found that a man was one of many that had been labelled as killed in the accidental detonation. And so he decided that the truck wouldn't be missed. He felt a bit wrong forging a man's signature on the title, but either way, he was managing to get ownership dating the sale a couple of weeks prior to everything that happened. My Stephanie had taken to Tyler like a fish to water, though somewhat distraught at first, and she became the loving wife he'd only dreamed of. She turned in a claim to her grandmother's life insurance company before seizing her grandparents' assets. Her and Tyler were doing pretty well already, when she received a large keep-your-mouth-shut-and-be-happy settlement check from the government in compensation of her grandmother and her only home being destroyed and the property being deemed unlivable. Well, that entire town and surrounding area was now an exclusion zone, much like Chernobyl, a devastated radioactive wasteland. The entire investigation into the two of them was totally thwarted with a single statement.
Tyler's hunting trip was simply said to be a rouse to throw his then-girlfriend from the truth of his affair with Stephanie. He claimed, as did she, that his only true business in that town on that fateful weekend was driving to pick her up before secretly returning home for a weekend of a romantic escape. Honestly, everyone from his boss to the interview and agents believed his story without question, especially after he got a friend to play the angry girlfriend role. And Tyler and Stephanie wet two years into their relationship and he left his construction job for a maintenance position at a lumber treatment facility. Not a pay was much better and he enjoyed the work of repairing broken machinery. The Tyler pulled a 14-foot John boat from the trailer behind the truck and drug it into the water's edge. He placed a four-horsepower Yamaha Marina outboard onto the transform and set to secure a net to the boat while Stephanie loaded the fishing equipment. They launched the boat by paddling it around 10 feet from the shore and he pulled the ripcord three times. The two-stroke engine churned to life as he slowly thumbed the choke off and revved the throttle. The engine would only push the boat a few miles an hour, but it did the job. He steered into the long, narrow cove before slowing the engine to idle. While Stephanie began unrolling jug lines as Tyler baited the big hooks with medium-sized minnows. She tossed the jugs overboard, about every 30 feet, making a trail of little great boys behind them. Jugs are simply about a foot-long length of foam pool noodle, with about 8 to 10 feet of braided masonry twine, ending in a brow swivel with a snail rig and the weight on the end. Now a snail rig is just a heavy piece of monofilament tied to a number six fishing straight shank fishing hook with a loop on the opposite end. Unlike some fishermen, some use the snail rig to loop through the bottom eyelet of a barrel swivel so in the event of a large fish dragging the jug away far into the night or dragging it deep underwater where it tangles to an obstruction. The fish can break the monofilament and avoid starving to death. All in all, given a wonderful creature a chance to continue living instead of becoming a waste if it cannot be retrieved. Now the pair spent about two hours on the water, setting about 80 jugs into two coves and a few just at the main port of the holiday park. Tyler gone the little engine and Stephanie scanned the distance. As she pondered about the man with the unkempt hair and a bushy beard she'd seen a few times as he dipped his oar from side to side in the distance. Her thoughts were disrupted as the engine quietened and Tyler stood with his hook pole in hand reaching out to corral a bobbin jug. He grasped the phone and then the line as he drew a very nice 10 pound flathead catfish into the boat. He dropped it into a bucket of water and fished a fresh minnow from the bait's bucket before raveling the line back and around the jug and slinging it from the boat. The jug hit the water and slowly spun as the weighted line unrolled from the body of the boy. He took his place once more, grasping the tiller handle as the nose of the boat pitched slightly up and with the boat coming back under power. He looks at Stephanie and smiled. Babe, it's about time you learn how to drive a boat. A glowing smile lit her face as she seated herself on the rear bench of the boat. All right, now you turn the throttle clockwise to increase the throttle and back the other way to decrease. The lever on the side there is pretty simple. It's a gear shift. It's in the center position now. You idle the throttle and pull it forward for forward gear and push it back and hold it for reverse. Never shift while the engine is running fast and Always wait until the boat slows while changing from forward to reverse or you'll rip the transom off the boat and sink. Now, the most important part. To turn left, you steer the tiller right and vice versa. Well, it takes some time to get used to, but it's pretty easy after a little while. Here, we'll go a couple of miles back towards the Lynn Colton Highway and back so you can learn. He said, pointing towards the main channel. I don't I need a boater's license? She asked when he'd finished his instructions. No, here in Georgia, all you need aside from a registration card is your ID card or driver's license. Um, it's still in the truck, babe, she said. No, I got it right here, he said with a smirk, pulling her license from the pocket of his cargo shorts. 
The beauty grasped the throttle and steered the boat into the channel as the nose pitched up and the small craft gained a little speed. And Tyler, using an app on his cell phone, clocked their speed at a whopping 12 miles per hour as the current aided their travel. After around five miles of straight line travel, Stephanie wrenched a tiller right, bringing the boat in a wide left arc. Halfway through the turn, the engine began to sputter and then died as the boat set adrift on the light chop of the wide open lake. The Tyler was lifting a can of 40 to 1 ratio mixed gasoline and started towards the little tank atop of the engine when thunder rumbled not far away. He had been paying more attention to Stephanie than the sky above. Ah, rookie move there, old buddy, he thought to himself as he watched the dark bands of an approaching early summer school line. He quickly filled the fuel tank and replaced the cap before taking the helm once more. Now the wind began to pick up in the distance as he watched the white caps roll, and Tyler pinned the throttle to the max as he set a course back towards the shelter of the cove and the campsite. And Tyler's knuckles went white as he gripped the throttle and a starboard gunwale. The wind was gusting hard and the water became rough. He steered into the waves, turning his head to see a wall of white as drenching rain and mist filled the air behind the boat in a vast, fast-moving torrent. Tyler steered the boat towards the tiny island, watching the single tree uprooted in the near gale force gust that battered the tiny refuge. They rode perpendicular on the four-foot whitecaps until the boat crashed onto the shore of the island. He killed the engine and jumped out, dragging the craft onto the sand before producing a tarp from the storage compartment built into the center seat. He set about fastening the tarp over the boat and climbed in just as the torrent began to drench the island. The tarp kept him and Stephanie mostly dry through the short duration of a brutal storm. They emerged about ten minutes later to a light sprinkle in rain and cool wind gently stirring the water. He looked up to the grey sky above following the clouds across the horizon until he saw where they broke to clear skies. Uh, no worries, babe. It's over now, he said to Stephanie. Holy shit, that came out of nowhere, she exclaimed. It happened sometimes, especially on the lake. Good thing we made it to the island. Uh, there was a pretty good chance that we'd have capsized if we had kept heading in. Tyler and Stephanie motored across the slightly choppy open water as a cool breeze chased them to the cove. While entering the mouth of the cove, there were three jugs bobbing up and down as they were pulled slowly across the water. He steered towards them and got his pole ready. The first was a large crappy. The second and third were a nice flathead catfish. I Stephanie threw the last, freshly baited jug overboard. Tyler watched the jug disappear before bobbing up and then start tearing a path across the calm water in the deep cove. He set the throttle on high and steered to intercept, and Stephanie gripped the hook pole, reaching out and snagging the jug. There was a tremendous jerk on the other end before the mouth of a gar surfaced. The two-foot-long jaws were lined with hundreds of needle-point teeth, and Stephanie held the aquatic beast in place as Tyler moved forward. He grasped the deadly-looking fish by the back of its head, barehanded and bashed in its thick skull against the gunwale twice. He drew a four-inch-long fixed-blade knife and plunged the titanium blade into the head of the fish and then set to removing the hook. They baited the hook with a fresh minnow before motoring back to their campsite. And Tyler set about skinning and filleting the catfish while Stephanie built a fire inside the rock ring. Crickets chirped and the birds began to sing as the gentle waves rippled against the shoreline below camp. Tyler's deft hand skillfully rendered the meat from a beautiful fish he finished his knife work and began rinsing the pearlescent white strips of meat. He lit a propane burner and placed a large skillet full of oil onto it. The pair finished bread in the fillets as the oil began to bubble. The smell of the frying fish wafted into the canopy of trees above them as they idly chatted while Tyler honed the edge of his knife. The sunset painted the clearing sky and the water with shades of pink and crimson as they ate their meal. Ah, red sky at night, sailors delight, 
Tyler mused to his lover. You're not a sailor, but good job not flipping us earlier, Stephanie replied between bites of the succulent fish. Yeah, babe, a calm sea doesn't make much a skilled sailor. You know, I used to work on a fishing boat back when I was a younger guy out in Savannah. I saw some rough waters out there in the middle of the Atlantic. Okay, Boomer, she said with a giggle. It was true that Tyler was six years her senior, and she'd been 19 when they'd met just over five years ago. Tyler smiled and then shook his head. They finished off their meal and washed up their plates with the soap and the lake water. The sun had set and Tyler was tired. They piled the wood onto the fire and retired to his tent, followed by the blonde. Once laid down, she kissed him and he returned the favour. After making love to his wife, Tyler lay on his back with her head against his chest. Her arms were laced around him and his thick left arm wrapped around her thin midsection. Everything was right in his world as he pulled a drag from a Marlboro while listening to the haunting calls of several whirlpools. His unnatural nighttime eyesight aided slightly by the firelight and the gentle moonlight filtering through the fabric of their tent. Gazed across his lover's nude body, he truly appreciated her perfect curves and goddess-like figure. He allowed himself to drift off into a deep sleep, feeling absolutely satisfied with every aspect of his life on this warm summer night. Across the water, Bradley peered through his binoculars. His targeted pair had closed their tent two hours ago, and the fire was dying in their camp. He slowly eased his kayak into the water and began paddling across the channel at the mouth of the cove. At dusk, the ancient being had burst through the lid of the coffin that held him prisoner so long that his body had become dormant. Mika, the destroyer, the defiler, the consumer. The terror of the ancient world was once again free to reign supreme once more. He dragged himself across the still warm sand to the water's edge, his malnourished body aching for sustenance. His flesh withered and nearly translucent, showed bones and tendons as he slowly moved beneath the surface of the water. His keen eyesight allowed him to prey upon fish and turtles as he engulfed them with his mouth. After several hours, he had consumed enough of the aquatic creatures to replenish his strength enough to leave the water and find larger prey. He broke the surface silently, taking flight on massive wings. He soared above the world and below his eyes like radars. The tiny boat moving across the water captured his attention. The smell of sweat and flesh filled his nose. He could hear the man's heart beat over the sound of the paddle and gentle breeze. He tucked his wings and fell silently. Bradley Kemp had no warning as Mika's jaw unhinged in a serpentine manner before expanding much like that of a largemouth bass. The creature swept over his kayak and ripped his body from the seat in its unnatural mouth before swallowing him whole and leaving the kayak adrift and with a stolen pistol laying in the floor. Note from the author I would like to dedicate this series in the memory of Tiffany Thigpen. I spent a great portion of my life with this woman, and she entered into rest in the morning hours of Monday, June 29th, 2020. She left behind two amazing sons, Thomas and Tyler, her grandmother Judy, a plethora of family and friends, and in my personal opinion, a very great and gentle-souled husband, Clay, who genuinely made her happy, something that I could never fully achieve. I will be forever grateful to this man for being a source of true happiness to her. My hopes are that in this dedication, her memory will live on for a time unending. 
She left this world way too soon. So many things were left unsaid and undone, and she will be greatly missed by many people. Any thoughts or prayers from my fans and supporters have and may be sent to me via the Facebook group or through Facebook Messenger, and I will forward them to her family. Thank you to all of my supporters and fans, and thank you once again to Dead Man Talking for having me on your channel as an author. I'm so appreciative of everything. And as always, much peace and love, and be safe, not sorry. With regards, Mr. Savage. As you know, brother, I'm very, very sorry to uh, hear the passing of your ex-wife, mother to your children, and uh, I just pray that they're all holding up okay. But we're going nowhere, so whenever you're ready, I'm ready. Guys and girls, as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? and DMT's Cryptid Crew. Of course, if you're looking to support the show further, you get exclusive access to members-only videos and early access videos, click the link in the description box below. And of course, you can find all my social media links in the description box too. As always, guys, I hope your family and friends and yourselves are happy and well, keeping fit and focused, but above all, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>